Uh, as, as I understand it, it is being debated uh, by the government and no decision yet has been made. And I mean, I, I can't comment on the, the deliberations of the Ministerial Advisory Committee at all, but it is something that I would support in my personal capacity. I do think these these regulations, as you said, have now probably played, the, played out and are no longer relevant for public health purposes because of a number of changes that we, we are aware of in the disease now that we weren't this time last year. To some extent, I mean, there are uh, countries, first world countries, maybe even in the, in the East, who are still very much uh, 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 pinning their hopes on quarantine, pinning their hopes uh, on contact tracing. For example, if you look at South Korea, they, they still think it's a, it's, it's a very useful tool. Why would that no longer be relevant for us? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think the key thing is it depends what sort of proportion of the cases you're able to identify with your current country's capacity and with the with the testing algorithms you have. So in something like South Korea, for example, when visitors come, they will test absolutely everybody. And even in their own country, they can test a huge proportion of cases. In South Africa, though, we probably only identify about one in every 10 or one in every 15 cases that actually occur. And we know this when we compare the number of cases which are reported versus the number when we look at antibodies that we know the people have had in the past. And so when you're only finding about one in 10 to one in 15 cases like we are in South Africa, you just don't then find the right people to quarantine because for all those other cases where you're not finding, no one is quarantining. And so the public health utility of this is really, really limited and the downsides are quite severe. Yeah. So let me understand clearly what you're saying. You, you, you are not necessarily saying quarantining doesn't work, but you're saying uh, our contact tracing is so ineffective that we hardly ever get people that need to be quarantined. So we might as well just uh, abandon both. Uh, kind of, yes. So, I mean, I, I do think that quarantine is, is probably overvalued in every country because it's really a, it's a control measure. You know, in other words, it's a, it's a measure designed to stop the spread of the disease. But really, we're not in that phase of the, of the disease anymore, anywhere, anywhere in, the, in the world. Yeah. We really do need to start living with this as a, as a mitigation strategy. So we're trying just to not to stop the disease spreading but to mitigate the effects through things like vaccination and mask wearing and other things. Yeah. But certainly in South Africa, it's a, in a different scenario to high income countries where a far greater proportion of people are identified. And so quarantining at least has more public health utility in our country and in our setting. And in fact, in most low and middle income country settings, yeah. it's really mostly a waste of resources, in my opinion. How different is that from isolation? And currently the president uh, is uh, in high spirits. We care, responding very well to, to the treatment of his mild symptoms. But say if he was asymptomatic, uh, are you saying that he doesn't need to isolate? So these, it's a really good, really good point. So these, the things I'm talking about uh, are quarantine and contact tracing. So quarantine is for those, as you said, who, have, who are contacts of a case, but don't have COVID themselves. So it's the sort of the case where you've, you've got someone across the office from you who tested positive and now you have to go into quarantine. That, I think, really has no public health utility given the number of cases we diagnosed. But isolation, when you, do find, when you are the case, I think because you're still infectious in the beginning, there's still going to be a role for that. And I, I do think at least for a few days, and maybe less days than we are, are, are currently used to 10, maybe it can be shortened a bit, but the concept of isolation still does hold for infectious people. I'm more worried about the quarantining, which is really for those contacts of infectious people, which I think is the downsides of which massively outweigh any benefits. Yeah. Of course, there's other impacts uh, to, to quarantining, uh, or is at least the fact that you're, you're separated. And uh, in, in most instances, you're also nervous about what the outcome is going to be of the test. But, uh, of course, barring uh, of late with a little bit of a discount, there are also financial implications to these quarantining as well as testing. Massively so, and, and that's really not well appreciated um, by many people. And, you know, for example, people have to take time off work. If work is, is more, of a, more of a wages thing, you may lose wages. Um, entire clinics in Gauteng and other provinces are under severe strain, and some of them have even had to scale back services because there's so many staff off quarantining. Um, police stations have had the same in my area. Uh, you know, central government services are, are disrupted. People's economic lives are disrupted. It really is a huge amount of, of downsides to this. And this is a very extreme measure. And, and it did have a role in the beginning, at least based on what we knew about the virus. But now that we know better things, I think that the time for it has passed.
Now, what does that mean around, uh, for example, the various databases that we fill in, the, 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 the surveys that we fill in about our temperatures, about how we're feeling, and so on and so forth? Many have said these are, are quite critical, for example, in, in tracing uh, ground zero or day zero when, when uh, uh, for example, a variant like Omicron would have, would have occurred. What are we going to be able to use then uh, as far as sequencing is concerned if we do not have this database? Yeah, so, so things, I mean, things like temperature screening is, is a different topic, but I, I do think that that equally is not a very good method of finding people because we know many people are asymptomatic, and that's something we didn't know at the beginning of the outbreak last year. But we do know that perhaps as many as 80% in some studies of people don't have any symptoms. So when you're screening for temperature, you're going to miss most of them. And even those who do have symptoms are not often, don't, often temperature is not one of them. So I think that's that's one thing which is again has outlived its use, I think. But in general, what we can do is actually relatively simple, but very well 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 known now. You know, vaccination really does help. Um, and it helps you and it helps protect others. Mask wearing really does help, particularly when you're indoors, because this is really an airborne spread virus. And avoiding big indoor very venues with lots of people around the time of a peak, at least, um, is, is a very sensible thing to delay the transmission a little bit and give yourself the best chance. And I think if you stick to those two or three things, um, that really is the bulk of what we know works. Yeah. And much of the rest of it can hopefully be scaled back in the next few months. So, I mean, for workplaces, what, what needs to happen then? I mean, what is your suggestion? What is the key variable that will ensure that uh, uh, the cases are rapidly and reliably identified? Well, I don't think, given the fact that we have so many asymptomatic uh, individuals who have COVID, I don't think it's ever going to be reliable, a really useful way of identifying all of them. I don't think that's realistic to some degree. So what I really think is more important is to focus on what you can do to mitigate the transmission. So not prevent it, but mitigate it. In other words, ensure as much of the workforce is vaccinated as possible. And whether that comes from a mandate from the government or a mandate from your employer or just an encouragement from your employer, it's up to the, up to the individuals. But as many people as vaccinated as possible makes the workplace environment safe and also prevents people from getting severely ill if they do get it. Mask wearing, at least when you're in closed areas with lots of other people, really does help, at least for now in this phase of the epidemic, that makes a lot of sense. And improving ventilation in general, you know, if it's possible to, you know, to, to crack the windows open when it's a bit warmer or improve the ventilation in general, this will help. Um, but I don't think, sadly, it's realistic to, to ever hope that you'll find all of the cases in any particular uh, institution. It's really about mitigation rather than prevention. Yeah, uh, this one probably most employees who have to pay for their tests would find uh, quite useful. Uh, you're saying if you're asymptomatic, if you're not sick, uh, you don't need to test? For the vast majority of cases, yes. I mean, there will always be exceptions to all of these things, such as, for example, if, if I was going to work with transplant patients who are very immunosuppressed, I might want to have a test even if I don't have symptoms. So that, that, you know, there are always going to be some exceptions. But for the majority of cases, yes, I, I don't think it makes sense to test routinely if you're asymptomatic, um, at least for the 99% of the instances. And we, uh, I'm aware as well, as you said, that the, the enormous cost of the PCR tests, I know it's come down in the last week uh, after the Competition Commission had a look, but it's still expensive. You're still looking at 500 rand or more, which puts it well over the, out of the range of most people. And then rapid tests are a bit cheaper, but still difficult and often the access is limited. I'm reading a very interesting uh, uh, event that's happening on Twitter uh, with one of, of, of the social media uh, people that traveled, right? They tested twice uh, while they were here and they tested negative. But turns out when they got to the airport at their destination, they are now uh, positive. But you, 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 you raise another issue here that uh, the testing itself does not always find the virus when, when, when it is there. I mean, uh, or sometimes it says it's not there when it is uh, actually there. That raises a question about the reliability of this test. Well, I, I think that it is a good point and it's worth considering, you know, the utility of these, these tests. And again, I don't want to overplay this. I mean, the tests are very good, but we do know that they're probably only about 70% sensitive. And, and that means that they're only going to find the disease about 70% of the time when you truly do have it. Um, many of those that they miss will be the less infectious people because their viral load is lower and it's harder for the test to find it. But still, the tests are nowhere near perfect. While they are very good, they're nowhere near perfect. And so when you're doing this en masse, we know that you're going to miss a certain proportion of people. And 
you know, when, and we're seeing this happen all the time, when people go and get tested, uh, you know, when they leave and when they arrive at a destination after a flight, often those test results are different. Um, and so again, as you rightly said, it's the utility of them is quite limited and it's something that we also have to consider. I don't think it's going to change any time soon, I'm afraid, but it is something over the long term that we may have to reconsider.